posters and three wonderful talks, three very different talks, you know, some, some very uh, hard brain data uh, to working with kids um, and to working with um, uh, older, older <laughs> um, but yet everybody has similar questions, I think, that they're, that they're asking using different techniques and different populations. And so at this point, um, We'd just like to open it up to general questions that might apply to more than, you can ask a question to a specific person, but general questions that might apply to, to two or more of our speakers um, that are things that you think might be important for the field, things, things we should think about uh, going forward, uh, research programs and, and considerations and, and the like. So we open it up. Thanks to all of you for your talks. Um, I'm interested in uh, how Amber kind of fits into the equation for each uh, each one of you, and uh, I guess how you consider it in your research, and um, maybe what it has to offer us that maybe hasn't been explored quite as much. Because I hear a lot more about pitch and time than we do about the Amber aspect of things. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think I think in okay. Is that better? Um, for our, our milestone study, which is the, the Viet Suzuki violin intervention, um, I think that timbre is an implicit part of it. Um, and so, and even though you know we're interested in, in focusing on rhythm, you know, pitch is, an, is also an important part of the violin training. Um, and so I think that it, it could be one of the things about music that's sort of intrinsically motivating that helps to um, booster attention and bolster social engagement. I don't think that we know quite as much about how that works, uh, at least I don't yet. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in learning more. Um, slightly off topic, but since you asked about timbre, we do have some um, data from people with Williams syndrome um, that are really good at perceiving differences in um, Tambors between instruments, so that's been. We should submit that for publication. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> me. Um, and that's led by a very much <laughs> who's been bugging me to get that paper out for a long time. But we've been sort of busy getting these other intervention studies up and going. And so, um, so I think there's some connections there, and uh, maybe that's one way that we can, you know, through the the tambors, different tambors that are involved in, you know, exploring these with. So with the parent-child music class, you know, kids playing on just these simple little instruments and singing, all that is timbral exploration, and maybe that is you know, motivating to them and to the parents. Actually, it seems to be a simple question, but can it's a very uh, complex concept to start with. On the other hand, it is maybe the least, in my experience, vulnerable to lesions, disorders. I mean, it's something that is quite robust. Why? Because there are so many aspects in that time. But it's not really without, it's related to pitch as well. So it's not easy to assess time or in isolation. We have done it, but we never had very interesting data because most of them, I mean, most of the species I've been studying, including old people, elderly, Alzheimer, uh, aphasics, not only in music, but I didn't mention that. Um, they can process many aspects of that, many, like voice. And in the literature, you don't find really people who have a selective deficit with them. There is one group actually on musical time. Uh, voice is something. It's starting because uh, the, it was discovered that you can have disorders specific to the recognition of voice. But it's very new, and uh, I'm not sure there are that many cases. Uh, two for the moment, I think, in the literature. So that answers in a very vague way why we didn't really uh, 
discuss that issue, but we did use that aspect, for example, in our, in using it to go back to what I was talking about this morning, uh, they can perceive roughness. And that allowed us to assess one of the most important theories of dissonance, Helmholtz theory, that it is really roughness, because we studied those cases, because they, they could perceive it. So they were questioning that theory, they were using harmony. So it's an indirect way to answer your, your question, but that would seem to be, so, they have so many different aspects. I think, I know that in, in therapy with children with hearing impairment, they is using different sounding instruments as a way of, of helping with the auditory discrimination test is used. So in that case, it's harmful, it is it's important. For them to be able to pick up the nuance of sound and to build that kind of discrimination that's moving from normal here. So here's an off the wall brainstorm of an idea that I'll just put out there. Um, something that we've been interested in but haven't followed up on yet is whether there is a relationship between perceiving speech and noise and that, that could be mediating what we're seeing between rhythm and grammar. And so I wonder if there's any relationship there with musical timbre. Oh, <laughs> someone uh, should do this. <laughs> I don't think so. Very happy. Should we move to the next question? Yeah. Uh, I was just going to add to the earlier thread, and I, I'm not speaking from a position of experience, but I, I was struck by your use of the accordion. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that um, you know that's an instrument that can maybe support the voice in the same way that an organ can. Yes. And so there's something about instrument selection in yep. therapeutic context I would expect. I, I understand that uh, ukuleles are uh, are effective, and I'm guessing it's because they make people happy. There's just an association. <laughs> and, uh, if you were to you know, walk in with uh, with what? With, uh, with bagpipes. <laughs> we, we have a problem. No, I don't. I love it. <laughs> you, you know what's interesting? But there's certain instruments that support the voice, and you know the organ is used in no, no, churches for a reason, right? Yeah. But that, but that's kind of trivial. Trivial? Well, no, yes, it's a trivial comment. Sure. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, Association. Actually, yeah. I can help. No, but not not the idea of organ supporting the voice. I think that, that that's based on something. It's not just an association. So can you elaborate? I I you know I haven't really thought about it analytically, but uh, I I think it's something about you you, know, you you play a note on the organ and you can carry it for a long period of time. So it's when voices fade. Because you know you, you have a a lot of stuff, a lot of pressure, and it it uh, recedes over the right. course of the phrase. That doesn't happen with the organ, so it's like a high bar that you need to okay. keep up with. And I I think there's something uh, uh, something about that high bar that, that works with the voice. I don't think it's an accident that organs exist. Uh, uh, were installed in, in churches around so the Western far, world. Okay, I understand. Yeah. The comment I want to make today, it's interesting because I play the quality because I play the quality like since I was a little kid. Yeah, me too. Wait, it's, so, wait, so, wait, so, wait, so, wait, so. wait, looking at the videos and understanding some of the, uh, some of the new research about the body rhythm and then forming um, through this mutual rhythmicity between people, how that also informs the response of the client. And so the accordion moves in rhythm too, unlike other instruments. I mean, if you play cello, you're almost, so there's a rhythmicity to the accordion, and it also has an expressive because it breathes. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's the extension of that sound that also informs the voice and the responsiveness of the patients, besides all the ethnical and you know, other types of associations, but I think what's crucial from like a really pure, like more scientific point of view is the information that the accordion provides to the subconscious person listening. You know, how it informs movement, how it informs 
red support kind of informs emotion and feeling. In the way that Trump, I play trumpet professionally, as the way Trump can, it, it just has a different sense to it. I just, I, I just want to add a comment to it too, because um, I think timbre is really important in our emotional responses. Um, and I was really struck last night, I don't know how many of you were at the concert last night, tonight, what they But the child prodigy uh, who played, he's a, a pianist, and an amazing pianist. Um, and then we had a little uh, discussion with him uh, at the end of the, the concert. Um, the audience asked him questions, and he plays violin as well, but it's sort of a secondary instrument. And I forgot what the question was exactly, but he was asked sort of which one he liked better, which one he thought was most expressive, or someone, and he came out very surprisingly saying uh, he found the violin to be much more expressive emotionally. And when asked why, he said, oh, I can make different timbres on the violin. I can make, make different cry. sounds. Make I can uh, make you know, cry. That's what he said. Yeah, he said it makes me. The violin makes me cry. Yeah. Yeah. No, that it makes, makes people cry. makes one cry. Yeah. And so I think this timbre and variation in timbre is probably really critical to our responses to the other, the other piece. Um, it's interesting that people with Alzheimer's disease, if you play a familiar melody, they may show some recognition, but if you play the exact recording. But the exact vocalist, the exact instrumentation, that's what really gets the, the response. So it's like even that all of the, the elements of that sound that are crucial to that very recovery. So it's not just the rhythm and the melody of the song, it's the nuances of the creature that allow for deeper memory recovery, both recognition, I should say. And I think developing more and more ways to use the neuroimaging G behavioral methods to, you know, really with these ecological stimuli, so we can find out what's really going on in the brain that's connecting, you know, a very specific signal, Yep. Um, so we don't always have to use sort of um, these very well-controlled, but yes. maybe less ecological sure. 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 Important to have, I think, a balance of those. First of all, I want to thank all of you who pulled this together. I can't remember how many times now I've been here, but it just gets better and better. Congratulations. It's marvelous. Um, um, I want to tell you how grateful I am to learn a bit about concussions, given the fact that I've had two in my lifetime. So now I know what to do, so that I don't go AWOL up here. But my question is about autism. I don't know a lot about it, and I hope you do some workshops on autism in the future, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I was teaching piano to my neighbor's children because she was helping me with computer skills. Okay? Her youngest son is autistic. Okay, I had no problems teaching him the piano, but at the school that child was attending, they had given up on it. It was none of my bloody business, but I went to the school and spoke on his behalf, and a few things changed, okay? But that child was brilliant, and they were just doing all the wrong things, in my opinion. He's still taking piano. <laughs> okay, so please do something on autism, all right? Where's <laughs> one? So one thread that I notice kind of through, through a bunch of the work that was presented here today is this role of the, the role of motivation and how music, it seems, can really, can really bring about motivated participation in something in a lot of, in a lot of places where other types of interventions or, or regular day-to-day -day activities don't really uh, push that. And I'm wondering, the, the scientist in me is wondering what you think is, is it about the music that is making it so motivating? Is it motivating because it's effective, or is it effective because it's motivating? And if it is motivating, then what part of music, how can we, how can we extract the really, the really motivating part about it, part of, part of it 
out of it to make music, uh, music interventions and music lessons better? I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all wonder. <laughs> yeah. I don't have uh, an answer to that. We all have our yeah. own, but uh, this is really fundamental. It's, 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 it's why it's music it. is so engaging for humans. Maybe, Laura, you have your theory? <laughs> I, I can only speculate, but I, I everyone yeah. I, music has a deep evolutionary history. Mm -hmm. um, I think the main uh, reason why we develop such a um, complex musical system has to do with social interaction, uh, interaction between parents and children to begin with, but you know, between adults, you know, like all the places that have music. Um, as students, it involves human interaction, wanting people to feel a common emotion and come together socially to accomplish a goal. I really so remind you of your own words, affiliation. Affiliation. You really yeah, human affiliation. affiliation. And, and that's just really powerful. And it's, it's not only powerful, but it's there um, as early as we can see in young infants. So mothers are some to them from the time that they're born. Um, and the infants are responding to that. So I think it's biologically driven that, that these kinds of things are rewarded. So would that, would that predict then that music classes that happen in more of a large group, uh, yes. common bonding kind of setting would be yes. Yes. better no, for better as an intervention? There, is a, study, and there yes. is a study showing that the size of the choir matters for pleasure and for the resistance to pain. Yeah. I cited it in my Dunbar, Dunbar is worth three. And? It's Dunbar, I think it's... Uh, one of the authors. Yeah. The first one is Weinstein. Weinstein. I mean, it Weinstein was in Dunbar. one of yeah. my uh, slides I can yeah. give it to you later. Yeah. But it's really yeah. recent. It's and a also, few months ago. I also think that's really interesting. You think about how we um, train people musically in our culture. Because yes. it's quite anomalous to how music occurs in almost everywhere else in the world. That we isolate, especially piano is the work. You know, it's a, it's a lonely instrument, and that's it. It's individual lessons, and then we can sit down at the piano for an hour, be by yourself, and play. And you know, so if the kid is really motivated, they really want to play in a band, or they want to do whatever, they'll they may be okay. But without that social part of music, it's very difficult to motivate kids. And when we turn kids off to music, in fact, I think in many cases, by the way we. I just want to answer that because we think about, you sort of lose the communication aspect of music. Hello, you were saying how, you know, social, by social connection, um, our music is, is part of our social connection, way of socializing. We had a program at our facility where people who were quadriplegic or minimally functioning and nonverbal um, through with different types of digital technology created in the band. And these were people who couldn't communicate with each other, but to tell you their social, their personal demeanor changed completely because they were actually, you know, actually connected to other people for the first time in years. So even without words, the idea of interacting with another person is crucial to our well-being, and sometimes music can allow that to happen um, if the technology is going to provide it. But that need to connect with another person. I think is crucial to our survival, and music has served in that role for the most of our history. And I think that we can sort of build off of the qualitative observations that we make, and then start to be able to quantify things. So through you know this this video coding, which is you know you've got have some great students that are willing to sit there and do the coding, but actually a lot, a lot of the special ed students at Vanderbilt are really interested really in this. Good. Um, and, and so they're, they're, you know, incorporating the right techniques to be able to do this. And, you know, so we can start out with just qualitatively noticing, gosh, well, in our parent-child music class, like this particular song or this technique that the teacher used seems to be really motivating. So, you know, that appears to be working. How can we sort of emphasize that and then start to quantify it through these, you know, different measures and then looking at engagement and then seeing how that could predict, you know, their response to treatment. Um, or, you know, in, motive, in um, identifying subsets of, um, of people who may be um, the most 
who could benefit the most from the treatment. So um, it may be that you have to have a certain like baseline level of engagement to do well, or it may be the people that are the least motivated or the people with the least good rhythm that, you know, so we don't know. All these things are things that we don't know. And uh, I think, you know, in clinical research, when we can start to get into large to sample size studies, and we can start to incorporate some of these really interesting questions about um, mediators and moderators, and you know who's who is the best fit for this, and um, so that we can make some really great clinical recommendations that are really you know individualized and personalized. But it's going to take a lot to get there. <laughs> um, John, can you add something to that? Um, the point was made very early and several times that I think um, also fits this. Obviously, everything you said was correct in terms of therapy, but I think the original question was why is music so compelling? Why is it so pervasive? Why is it everywhere? And I think part of the issue is the thing that's making it difficult to say is that it's really complicated. <laughs> that there are lots of factors. I'm mean, going to talk about timbre and then you know, harmony and technology, and there's rhythm and beat, and there's all sorts of aspects to it. And there's a social aspect they all interact with. But because of that, it has lots of different facets that makes it, makes it Virtually everybody, although obviously not quite everybody, but everybody connect in some way, but it might not be the same ways at all. And, you know, yes, it's social, but an awful lot of people enjoy just playing by themselves too. They're really intellectually interesting, or it's emotionally interesting on their own as well. So I don't think we're going to find a single answer at all because of the, the multiplicity of, 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 uh, of functions, of uses. And, and the way it interacts with people, and being culture, uh, culturally uh, specific in some ways as well. I mean, it's just really, really complicated, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, just um, a follow-up question for the panel. I, I think if you look at medicine in general these days, it's moving more and more towards what they call individualized medicine. So everyone's you know, genes are slightly different, they're going to react slightly different, maybe different medications, different interventions, different treatments. Is there anything going on in the music world where we're really getting close to individualized music medicine? <laughs> Not that I know of. <laughs> We are far from that. We're, we're, we're really interested in that, but we have a lot more groundwork to do. So we're trying to put into place you know, things like pre-treatment measures or genetic tests that we can, you know, make some sense of um, to at least make hypotheses about response to treatment and personalized medicine so that we can then, so in, in 10 years, maybe I'll have those. So we're, <laughs> the, only, the, only, the only thing that comes close to that is um, the music and memory program, which is the personalized, personalized music playlist for people with Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And so there's actually a, uh, a uh, questionnaire that goes out to a family member, they um, highlight all the favorite songs that the person has. That, that becomes like a prescription. Although, although it's a question of cohort. That's exactly right, yeah. So, yes, I mean, if it's you are to be in the same court, in the it works. same environment, more or less environment, we know what kind of music we right. listen to. So, right. But that's, it's, it's personalized. Yeah, that's nice. yeah. So my question is vaguely related, but it's, it's it's different in that I'm, I'm wondering where where what role tech has to play in this. I know Connie mentioned that MIT, for example, can be somewhat prohibitive because it, it requires a, a huge, intense uh, effort on the part of the therapist, and therefore not everyone can afford it. So. The way in which tech seems to be um, developing is that it can be interactive and that it can personalize itself, it can see what the uh, abilities are of the, of the user of the system and adapt itself so it can be intelligent to some degree. But I just wonder what you, what you feel the role of, of smart technologies might actually be in the future for, for therapies, including neurological music therapy. Well, I know that there are some apps now that will take the um, accelerometer that you can interface with an iPod, iPhone, or you know, smart technology, smartphone, and the te that technology will provide a rhythmic cue, so say for personal preferences, 
and actually track their gait all the time. So that kind of smart technology is, I know it's been developed, yeah. how, how available it is at this point. That, that's Yi Wang's work from the city Singapore. Yeah, there's a few. Yeah, Bihu and Canada. Uh, yeah, yeah. So a few, but, but that type of possibilities are also, um, I'm not sure this which one you know, uh, there's some aphasia tools that are now um, iPod and iPad based that actually provide some of these structural uh, things, interactive things. And there's ones with, ones with speech too, I mean with pitch perception. It's called oh, City. There are so many so where the person is instructed to match a very broad pitch. So say you're off, say you can't sing a key, um, the target key may be like a plus minus a few sets above or below the pitch. And then as you get closer to the pitch, the, the signal becomes smaller until you actually are on pitch. So those kinds of feedback programs are available too. And I think on, on the assessment side, um, having more mobile technologies that you can bring into the classroom, you know, that are less scary than, you know, EG or sort of, <laughs> like the EG that we do in the lab, but so things that are just um, a little bit less intimidating and just easier and cheaper to, so that we could test, you know, a large number of children, um, you know, that's, I think that's a, a big deal. Um, and, and even within the lab, having access to um, really streamlined and reliable technology to do things like combined EG and eye tracking, which we know is possible, but it's not really that straightforward. And so you have to just have a lot of people power and spend a lot of time on the, you know, developing these analysis methods, you know, analysis methods and, you know, troubleshooting with the technical end of it. So um, I think that that becomes a rate limiting factor in really using the full range of interesting tools. Um, and, and especially across different laboratories and in different, you know, in different uh, socioeconomic situations. Do we think there's a potential danger that technology itself can be somewhat culturally specific? That it, the hardware can impose certain uh, limits on the types of therapies which are developed, which may not be appropriate in all, for all demographics and for all uh, geographical regions? Yeah. You know, uh, it's always the case that um, people, when people see something is successful, they tend to mass produce it and they go, why would they especially make money from it? Um, music, using all the, uh, using familiar music say for somebody with Alzheimer's disease can be hit and miss because you don't always know the personal associations with the music. So in the case of generalizing music to a broader population, it can be really da dangerous because if the person had a negative association with a piece of salt or a good piece of music, can actually put them into a deep depression or, or affect them. If somebody has epileptic seizures, for example, certain pulses, certain sounds can actually cause seizure disorders or can exacerbate seizure disorders. So it's like buyer beware. As these things become generalized, um, people need to know what the potential harm is for the music. The music can't be awful. It obviously can't be because we have such strong emotional associations, and then physiologically too, we know that it can affect the function. Is that what you had in mind? Yeah, I didn't understand, <laughs> that, that, I didn't that, understand that, that in your but, question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, to, to, some, to some extent. I mean, obviously, a lot of research and development is going on. It's going on in the West, in, in other countries, in Asia as well, to some, to some extent. But it's being led a lot by labs in the West. And I, I just wonder if the, how much, uh, you know, we have a, a certain inherited view of what music is and what music practice is, which might not be entirely uh, as ubiquitous as we think it is. And therefore, the, uh, the interventions that we develop uh, may be applicable for, you know, population of baby boomers. Uh, in North America, but they may not be entirely right for other populations. And I just, it's a sort of general question about, I mean, interested in music and tech and, and its therapeutic application, but uh, always with, with the caveat that um, I'm coming at it from a particular cultural angle that has certain biases and a predisposition to go into. You can't help that to some degree. But it's, it's aware of it, you know, we have to be aware of it, but it is a limitation. Particularly when you, you can develop an app and you can launch on the store, and that goes global. 
Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, I noticed there was a, such a nice parallel between uh, a museum and Arpazia, where one can, uh, cannot song without wall, and the other cannot speak without song. So I wonder if there is a like, cross study between those two pathologies uh, that uh, show why both of these pathologies, in both of these pathologies, they can, they, are, they can, like, when they with lyrics, when you speak with music. Um, there is such study that uses the pathology, or maybe even the brain studies would be very interesting. So I'm going to answer that. <laughs> um, yes, of course. Uh, we have done so. We haven't published everything. Generally, it's very difficult to publish what is negative. Fine. We had a series of success stories, but in reality, we, for example, we did uh, study uh, aphasic patients. I mean, we were, I think, the first to revisit the fact that um, uh, when you sing, you, uh, the, you, you can sing the lyrics you cannot pronounce, that the old traditional textbook uh, teaching and actually, I didn't want to stress it, but uh, of course it's overlapped. I mean, when you know the songs, of course it's going to be easier and more rewarding because you know what to, to you can predict what one word, uh, it's automatic. So it has to be properly studied. That's just for the basis. It seems to be simple, but when you analyze production data, and many in this room know what it means, it's a lot of work. So you, you really have to uh, make sure what you are analyzing, that's the first one. So you cannot compare speech, uh, generative speech, like the one we are using, and lyrics that are automatic for once. So, but if you want to compare in music and uh, in physics, you can easily do it, of course, because you have some material. And that's an idea, material to compare speech and music. Although that there is a debate, is it free speech or is it uh, music or because it's both, of course, when you separate the two. So I think that what we have illustrated is that, yes, when you have both, it helps. And my interpretation of that, uh, I don't want to give another lecture, of course, but no. <laughs> it's another topic. It's how you encode in memory sounds. And in my mind, it's a dual code. So it's better to have two codes than only one. That would be my problem. <coughs> but there is, there are papers on that issue if you enter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't want to be the one. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other questions? Okay, well then, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Uh, thank all the poster presenters. It was a great set of posters today. I really learned a lot. And of course, thank our three speakers. And I uh, hope to see you there tonight. And if not tonight, I'll see you next year. <laughs>